Now here we want to look at what is happening on a global level as well, but we want to break it down a bit more. And, and we've been talking about the, the income gap and what does that mean in terms of, okay, we have inflation coming, we know it's there, PPIs are going up, we're getting this pressure, but how is that going to impact people's savings? How is that going to impact wages? You know, these are things that we want to continue to look at because when we look at this daily activity, this is a slide from last week, you know, you can see that we're at something that we've been saying that we're going to end out at a very similar spot because the advanced economies will drag down the emerging markets because they're not going to buy as many raw materials. And here you can see just general activity is consolidating around this 80 to 85 percent level of normalcy with China now kind of falling back in line, which we're going to talk about on an economic level in the last segment. So on a global level, you can see that net net we're at 80 percent. So we're 80 percent of normal. And as we've been talking about, we just don't see a lot of that changing over the next uh, the next few months as we get this push and pull in terms of some reopenings, some you know uh, shutdowns again, slowdowns of COVID restrictions in going back and forth. Italy's one of them. But again, we need to see vaccinations accelerate to get a certain amount of confidence back in the consumer because the consumer is going to be, I think, the biggest uh, problem over the, the next few years because it's going to come down. When, do the, when does the consumer reject price increases on inflation? And then how much is left for the company to eat? And I think that's going to be that, that competing factor that we need to look at. So this is looking at the uh, income gaps when we look at, um, at just the different regions. So the average annual per capita income losses are projected to be highest in emerging markets, not surprising, reversing gains in those poverty reductions. So coming back to the first, slot, the first segment where we talk about food pricing and the other pressures in general, this is going to continue to weigh on what are the income levels because right now a lot of these companies on the emerging markets are also dealing with inflation their costs are going up so they're going to have to try to find ways if they can't push through those increases or if they can are people going to buy less like how many people do you know have canceled decks or fences or things along those names. And this isn't just the US, but on a global level, because lumber prices are too high or because raw material prices have gone up as copper you know, continues to, to move up. This is, again, going to weigh on just where people are earning, who can earn money, how can you invest on an asset level, which is why we're seeing these incomes continue to widen and the gaps continuing to drive, drive further, which the U.S. is still subject to, as we see with continuous riots and, and protests, where I, given there's there's the racial side, and, and I'm not discounting that because that is still a real th a real issue and something that, that deserves attention. But on the back end of it, when they turn violent and you start to see um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, people stealing and, and breaking in and looting, that's the word I was looking for, looting, when people are looting, I, that's that that's a something different. That is 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 expressing a certain amount of anger that is not on the peaceful end. And I think this is something that we're going to continue to see on a global front. Now, why is that going to happen? So this is just looking at the U.S. now. So wage growth using weighted averages for industry and employment levels on an annual change. So when people got laid off from low wage jobs, the benefits outweigh the income that they were earning. So at some point, that's going to drop off, or in theory, should drop off more aggressively. And as that happens, you're going to get incomes coming down. Now, as all of these individuals rush to get jobs at the same time, as they no longer have these benefits, they're going to find a an industry that has changed a bit, and they're not going to see the same types of jobs because we still will have some sort of restrictions on you know, distance or you know the amount of capacity, which again is going to limit the amount of activity. So then that's going to increase competition for these jobs, which will drive down wages. So that's not only a reversal, it'll be a reversal even further below where we started because of these adjustments, which is why savings becomes a bigger component. Because everyone points to, well, everybody saves so much, so they're all going to spend. Well, it wasn't equal. 
and it wasn't, and we have to look at a global level. So savings surged while consumption went down. Obviously, consumption adjusted, but it adjusted for the rich or the people well off. You didn't fly as much, go to concerts, you know, different venues. But those who never really did that, or that was a one-off special occasion, their costs continued to go up. So the savings remain skewed to the top 10% and that top level, as we've shown in other shows, which, which is why the savings is, is not the same when you think about what is, what, what is the total savings level. So the government-supported incomes had a huge surge in the areas where we saw the most uh, stimulus. Obviously, the U.S. and Canada are the largest. So Canada is continuing to push out additional QE, as we heard from today. But the U.S. is supposed to pull back. So as the U.S. pulls back, how much of that savings is going to be drawn down? Because prices are going up, so people are going to spend more from savings to try to maintain. And again, this is going to mitigate some of these assumptions of how much of this savings is going to get pushed into that market. And when we look at household debt by selected markets, so when we look at the debt levels that have come through, going through the third quarter of 2020, you can see that some of these debt levels have continued to trend higher. Now, people have taken out second mortgages or uh, other types of home equity lines to cash in, to spend, and, and again, we're starting to see some of that credit card data pull back already because a lot of individuals spent ahead of getting their stimulus, but this is just showing the trend moving in the upward direction from the emerging markets and then general developed markets Debts, household debts continue to go up, continue to trend higher when we look at it on an aggregate, because this is only through Q3, Q of 2020. It has come down to a point, but there's still a certain amount of support in that debt level because we do have more borrowing. We do have more uh, debt levels that will continue to come through. Now, when we look at global monetary and fiscal stimulus, this is what we were talking about with the amount of stimulus. So the U.S. is now at $12.3 trillion when we look at uh, potential central bank stimulus and potential fiscal stimulus, and this is as of the end of March 2021. So you can see that we've pushed about $12.3 trillion into the market, 57% on the fiscal side which is where we continue to see those those movements through the system. Eurozone's the same way. But when this goes away, when the stimulus goes away, we've already started to see a slowdown in activity because it's when people pre-spent their stimmy, now it's gone. Now what comes next? You know, do you get a job? Do, you know, are there jobs available? You know, we saw those spikes come up, but now there's going to be some adjustments made to the um, jobless claims just because there's some been reclassifications. And again, these are going to be those pressure points that we continue to talk about because this stimulus can't last forever, especially given where some of these rates are and, and how much we can actually paper the town. So when we look at the earnings side, so top 0.1% earnings grew 15 times faster than bottom 90% earnings. So when you look at who has been protected over time, again, speaking to that income gap, the Fed bubble in general, so when we look at what has happened, so when we had these pullbacks in 2000 and again, 2008, the finance, this is from, uh, you know, some, some, uh, funny commentary, but the bottom 90% dead in the water since the Fed started free money for financers because we're just not seeing it. So the top 0.1% has seen, the top 0.1% has seen growth of 343.2% in real annual earnings. Then the top 1% saw 157.3% in earnings. The bottom 90% has seen 22.2%. So again, when we talk about savings, who is saving? Who has the money to consume? The 0.1% never stop spending throughout this. They could fire private, they could do whatever. And the top 1% is back at it because they have gotten their vaccinations. But where does the real engine come in and how aggressive will that engine be, which is the issue that we continue to talk about. So then when we look at the, that wealth disparity, so when we look at the top 10%, 85.6 trillion, 50 to 90%, 34.8 trillion, 
bottom 50%, 2.5 trillion. So the wealth disparity, again, when you look at that shift, the wealth, and this is measured in assets and just total portfolio, we're just seeing this growth shift in one area versus the other, which is why this is going to, this is creating this dilemma because this is obviously in the U S this is not just in anywhere else. This is a global problem, but not where the U S is still subject to the same issues. Now, when we look at the security broker and dealer side, so the margin accounts, the here you can see China saves the world, as we've talked about in the past, when they got very aggressive in the end of 16 through 18, in terms of propping up the market, they were went out, stimu, uh, stimulated a significant amount, but now the bubble that we've achieved in margin is reaching these new levels, which again, they just makes the fall that much more painful because you can see where the housing top was and what happened to margin. And now we are falling from levels that we have really never been at before. So when we look at the cost of debt, because you know all of this stuff is gonna cost money, how do we do it? So the cost to service US debt remains low, but we're at that turning point. And this is what we keep talking about. We we're only we, we have to raise about 53% of the current budget has to be raised in the debt market. So we're not only rolling the debt that we currently have, we're also adding onto it. So even as rates go up, but they remain low, I'm not saying that they aren't low, we're still leveraging up and the average interest to expense is gonna continue, especially as the US 10 year, five year and two year are shifting higher. And then we're layering on more debt, which is just increasing that total cost. So then when we look at the US debt service costs are historically low, and this is what they're expected to be on the forecast side. So even though they're low now, it's what are they gonna be in the future as more continue to, to uh, every country and central bank in the world essentially continues to ease and continues a easy fiscal policy, which again is gonna put more competition in the market, more bond and paper into the market, which is going to drive up those interest costs. Again, which is we're at this low point, and as we come out of this low point, as we layer on more debt, the costs are gonna go up in general on a GDP level. And the Federal Reserve total assets continue to drift higher. So here you can see just in general, there's been a continuous stimulus in the market on the monetary side, not just the fiscal side. And we're now, we're talk now we've heard from Canada, they're talking about essentially pulling forward their tightening. The question is going to come down to, is the U.S. going to do something similar? And uh, short answer is no. But again, this is something that is going to come further into the lexicon as to when does that easing stop. So this is just one way of looking at some of those levels. But when we look at on an aggregate, when we uh, aggregate, when we take less eliminations from consolidation, you can see where the general moves have come and with that that shift higher in just total support in general, and the support remains. But this is looking at the overnight re reverse repo. So the the federal government has, well, the Fed has created assets where instead of going to the money markets account and, and trying to go into the repo between banks, which is where your money market accounts go, they've opened up a uh, overnight reverse repo at the New York Fed. So this is showing activity at the New York Fed is exploding. So instead of borrowing from, you know, UBS or JP Morgan, borrowing from Morgan Stanley or Morgan Stanley borrowing from Goldman Sachs, they're borrowing from the Fed. So if you look at this, the sustained increase signals that offloading of bank reserves from big banks to government money market funds. So they're going, there's so much cash at the bank that they are essentially have nowhere to put it, needs some sort of return. So they're dumping it into the Fed. The last time this happened, the we started to see Q easing end and started to see not, not really tightening right away, but we started to see talk of tightening. So now that we've seen these big increases, this is going to be one to watch as 88 banks are now in, are now going to use this, um, uh, that you, cause you have to say by 2 PM. So the numbers came out, 88 banks are using this, uh, this asset. And when we look at what this means in general, so here you can see that activity starting to increase. And this, this is a short-term relief valve for their balance sheet pressure. Last time this happened, QE stopped 10 months after in October of 2014. So 
this is going to be this is going to be something to watch and and I, again this is what we can continue to talk about when we look at short term duration and long term duration bonds as to those shifts because the bigger issue at this point is U.S. Treasury holdings by foreigners. So China has started to increase some of their purchases after this steady decline since 2014, and Japan has essentially flatlined their activity. So the foreign holders, this is just looking at China and Japan, but net foreign holders haven't been buyers of U.S. Treasuries for some time and will continue to be some of that drag on activity. And all the while, policy rate are, rates are starting to increase. So Belarus joins the emerging market central banks in raising borrowing costs. Here you can see like, where the policies have continued to increase. Russia had that surprise, Turkey, and other areas within the Eastern Bloc, Africa as well. So we're starting to see some of this tightness as, as countries are trying to get in front of this inflation push. That is not just a, a not just a, a, a buzzword. It's actually happening. Wait, we can show you the data where this is happening. It's not just being talked about. Companies are talking about it because they're seeing it. Customers are talking about it because they're seeing it. And so that's why when you talk about it, it's not you're not making it happen. You're just speaking to what you're seeing or what is going to happen, especially on the on the uh, corporate side. So then over the past two decades, episodes of rising yields have been met with uh, crisis. So every time we've gotten to this end of, a, of the bond bubble, there's a new crisis that has emerged. Now, the problem is each time we've hit these levels, we've had to increase the amount of stimulus because of the law of diminishing returns. So that's why when you look at the amount of zeros in this stimulus, you're seeing that try to get compensated, which again is putting additional pressure on what comes next. How big is the next one going to have to be? Or are we just at a point where there's little that can be done to try to rectify some of these pressure points, which is why we're going to continue to see some of this inflation and these rates go higher. And this is just looking at what that is. So when we look at the U.S. manufacturing PMI for delivery times, input prices and output prices, you can just see where things are. And that's why when we look at the more finished goods versus price inflation, we are seeing price inflation. It's already there moving forward. So U.S. firms in the manufacturing PMI are making up output prices uh, due to the unprecedented, unprecedented supply delays. Marking up of output over input prices is a global outlier reflecting rapid U.S. vaccinations and reopening inflation. So you get more demand with reopening. And you still have supply demand, uh, supply issue, supply line issues that are not going away. If anything, they're going to increase with additional COVID problems and other types of sanctions. Uh, looking at Russia, looking at China, these are things that are going to persist. So we're getting just in general, everything is up and to the right for input prices and then output prices. The question is going to be how much of that input price can be passed on. And again, this is coming from the IIF. So then when we look at business equipment spending, so the business equipment flatlined for a significant amount of time. So now, not only do we have a shortfall in technology and microchips, but it's coming at a time where computers and peripheral equipment are in higher demand than ever before. Now, this is also skewed because there's people are demanding more because they're trying to get in front of the supply de delays. But Again, this, is, this was expected in terms of tightness, but uh, given the time delays of new foundries, new facilities, and it's just getting exasperated based on some of these moves. And the spending is, again, going to also weigh on wage inflation because people, are, companies are looking to do more with technology instead of hiring new individuals. Now, capital spending on computer, computers and peripheral, nominal price versus yield, uh, real, you can see that the real spending continues to move up. It's, it, and this is the deflationary cycle that we've seen where prices have been deflationary. Now they're starting to creep up, and they were before COVID. This is the biggest thing that I think is missed in general is prices, we've, the U.S. has exported inflation for a long period of time, you know, Instead of producing in the U.S., we would export it to China. Then when China was too expensive or Vietnam was too expensive, we would go to Pakistan. And then when Pakistan was too expensive, we'd go to India and then Bangladesh. And we're coming to a point where exporting inflation is getting harder and harder along the supply chain 
which is why we're starting to see these shifts and the prices have been, ha it's been happening for some time now. Now, when we look at the, at the great inflation, as everyone likes to uh, quote, when we look at what happens normally, you can see that it doesn't happen all at once. It's not like we just get inflation and then it goes away instantly. It, 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 it builds. And this is just looking back into the 60s when we started to get this inflation. You started to get these cycles and then you saw spending continuing to increase with Vietnam, you know, countering communism. And that was where we continued to see this shift. We, and again, moving into those extremes. So that's why we continue to continuously see these push. But when we look at what has happened in general, this is going to become the biggest pressure, the biggest pushback is when do we get the inflation? When is timing? What is transitory? And given what is happening in the market right now, transitory is a relative term and the pressure is going to persist as we go through the rest of Q2 and well into Q3 at least. But this is something that we think is going to carry on well into 2022 and put pressure on what the consumer does and what that GDP recovery is, especially as some of the government stimulus starts to get wound down or at least not renewed just because some of these checks were one time only. And that's going to, again, put more pressure on us going forward.